let's jump right into our next panel, which is going to cover the future and the outlook for the tech sector uh, and how it is and will be affecting our individual work lives as well as the economy at large. Uh, we have the perfect moderator. I'm just going to keep talking, but uh, we have the perfect moderator for this panel. And it's my pleasure uh, to introduce you to another friend and CEPR colleague of mine, uh, Professor Nicholas Bloom. Nick is a CEPR senior fellow and a professor in Stanford's Department of Economics. He is the co-director of the Productivity, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a fellow of the Center for Economic Performance. His research focuses on measuring and explaining management practices, and he works on understanding the impacts of large uncertainty shocks. I'm going to move to the side here. Um, and during the pandemic, he has become CEPR's resident expert on the productivity effects of working from home and has written several CEPR policy briefs and conducted an incredible amount of research on the issue that's been in high demand as firms are trying to find the right balance in employees' hybrid work schedules. I think he's here. Some, oh, Nick is here. Some, is, it, it, I'm, I'm looking around. Someone's going to tell me that they see Nick. Oh, is he, is he over there? Oh he's, okay. oh, he's getting mic'd. OK. Well, he's very fast, so he'll be here very quickly. I run with him on Sunday morning. So uh, I suspect that the topic that will come up in this session, but for now, let me welcome my friend, colleague, and Sunday morning running buddy, Nick, and our next panelist to the CEPR Economic Summit. Professor Nick Bloom, take it away. Are we going up now? He's introducing us. I have no Thanks, idea. Mark. That's what I I'll thought. Follow you. So, why don't you come up on stage? I was going to. Thanks very much. Um, as I say, at Stanford, we always like to talk about technology. So, when we were th thinking about this session, started planning about a year ago, it was a pretty safe bet. And as you'll see, it's become even more topical than when we started planning this a year ago. We have three great panelists. Um, so first, I'm going to go through alphabetically, is Eric Yuan. Uh, so Eric was the founder and currently the CEO of Zoom. Um, the story goes that Eric was uh, working at Cisco, was working on WebEx, uh, came up with this, you know, this is going back kind of 10, 15 years to the 2000s, came up with this idea for a, uh, you know, a uh, video technology that was fast, would work on a cell phone, would be easy to load, very uh, portable. Apparently, he went to the folks at uh, Cisco and they said, no, um, I'm not sure this is going to work. There's not much demand for it. Uh, so, you know, after failing to persuade them, he left the firm to set up his, uh, his own company, Zoom, which has obviously gone on to do great things. I was mischievously tempted to find out the person that said no in Cisco and see if we could get them on the panel as well. Um, I think Eric might have enjoyed having them on the panel as well, but maybe next year. Um, Eric has, uh, I, Stanford, I'm going to do our best to take some uh, claim for some credit for Stanford for Eric's success. He was actually an exec ed program uh, many years ago, so you can see the direct causality from exec ed to very successful uh, tech CEO. And I discovered when I went to have lunch with him in uh, December that the first customer of Zoom was Stanford Continuing Studies, and of course still, still is a customer, so the longest customer. So very happy to have Eric. Um, next is John Hennessy. So John, quite astoundingly, has been successful in three different fields. It's kind of you know, amazing looking at his uh, resume. So first off, as an academic, he was a professor uh, for many, many years uh, in the computer science department here. He actually won the Turing Prize in 2017, which is like the Nobel Prize in, in uh, computer sciences, the, the most prestigious prize. Very impressive. That's his academic career. He had a second career in business, as you know. He founded MIPS. He sits on the board of Google. Uh, he's on the board of several other companies. And then finally, I guess everyone knows him best here. Of course, he was the uh, president of Stanford for 16 years. I, I, I should clap as well, because it was under John's watch that I was both hired by Stanford and got tenure. You know, the, uh, the two salient moments of my life, you know, very stressful. Uh, so thank you, John. You know, yeah. you know, uh, I think I was probably thousands of files. So, you know, he, he may be claimed that he can remember it at this point, but I'm sure that many thousands of files. Um, I discovered last week in the prep call, we also have something unusual in common, which is 
after the uh, multi-day power cuts last week, I suspect we both spent much of the weekend clearing out our fridge and freezer because there was uh, several trees fell down on campus, much of Palo Alto, Stanford, Menlo Park was out of power. So, you know, we're all, we're all, we were all suffering from that. And then finally, Karen. Um, Karen at this point feels like, you know, an old friend because we've been on so many panels to talk about the future of work. Uh, Karen, myself and Hayden Brown are actually on a virtual CEPA panel about three years ago. Uh, to talk about Hayden, the CEO of Upwork, to talk about the future of work. Uh, I follow her. I you know, learn an enormous amount from my work. We were just talking earlier about research, actually. Um, Karen is the chief economist at LinkedIn. Uh, before that, she worked at, uh, at Morgan Stanley. She also worked uh, in the New York Fed. In fact, when she was at the New York Fed was the period of incredible turbulence when the Fed did incredible things to step in and try and prevent some of the worst outcomes from the 2008 eight meltdown. Karen also sits on the board of Fannie Mae. She's involved with boards for the Chicago Fed, for the New York Fed. Most importantly, Karen was a Stanford undergrad. Uh, and I think because of the amazing teaching in economics she obviously had when she was here, fantastic teaching that uh, she had in economics. She went on to do a PhD uh, in economics in Oxford. And you know, I guess the rest is history. So the way we're going to set this up is Karen's very kindly going to give us a kind of an overview, five, honestly, five, ten minutes, just three slides to set the scene. There are three topics we're going to focus on. You'll see that, you know, it's going to be AI, basically, you know, tech slowdown, work from home. And then we're just going to go and open discussion. I have some questions, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So thanks very much, and I'll hand yeah. over to Karen. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, great. So I've promised to not hold you hostage and do a five-minute quick view of LinkedIn. Um, I will just say that the data I'm going to show you is really about what we see across the world. We have 800, I feel very short behind this podium, so I'm kind of, even in heels, leaning over. We have about 890 million members. They're obviously not on all the time. That would be fun. But um, we get a lot of data about how people think about their career, the arc of their career, the skills they have, whether they're getting hired, whether they're looking or hiring. And so I want to show you some just quick slides. They're almost like an amuse-bouche for a conversation. So I'm going to go fast and then go sit down, and we're going to have a conversation. All right, so one of the things we can look at is hiring rates. So our members are telling us, hey, I got hired. I started this new job. Um, and so there's some element of turnover and job changing. And what you see from here is just the dip on the far left, which is the pandemic, um, which I could talk for hours about because it's very interesting. Women kind of disappeared for a few months. And I was like, what is this? And I was like, oh, right, we're all at home trying to figure out what to do with our kids. Um, and then hiring picked up and really accelerated through 2021. The blue line is everybody. The orange line is tech. And it's actually tech plus. So you can think of your Peloton. You can think of LinkedIn or Amazon or Google. You can also think of um, entertainment companies like Netflix. That's in the orange line. And so you can see this like really fast hiring that then started to turn down. And what, the way I would describe it is the blue line is this gradual eroding in hiring that was happening across uh, the US economy. And the orange line is this very aggressive stomping on the brakes that happened in tech. They kind of were like, I've eaten too big of a meal. I need to digest all the people I've just hired. Um, and so that's kind of what we're seeing. And it actually predates the publicly available data a little bit. I can never get non-farm payrolls correct. So you can go and look on YouTube all the times I try to predict it on CNBC and got it wrong. Um, but we do have a pretty good advanced sense of like hiring and job opening. So this is what we're seeing. So tech definitely hit the brakes in about March, April, right around the time the Fed started to hike. And the two most interest rate sensitive sectors, negatively sensitive, um, would be real estate and tech. And we saw a decrease in hiring that was more aggressive in both of those. OK, I'm going to go fast. I get asked a lot, like, what's going on in tech? How did, what happened? And um, where are they all going if they all got laid off, which they did not all get laid off. But let me explain the chart. So the light green lines are all pointing up. Show the, show the change in hiring for tech workers um, in the year from January 21 to January 22. So there's 12 months there. And so up until January 22, the prior 12 months show these massive increases of hiring. Basically, 2021, everybody in tech was hiring. And then starting in 2022, up until this past January, 
everybody stomp the brakes in hiring. So I'm telling you the same story again. We can just see the slowdown in hiring. And it happened in so many countries. This is an industry story, not a US story. Um, I'm going to keep going because I promised five minutes. I could say more. I want to switch gears, hard left. Let's talk about remote work, hybrid work we will get to with Nick, who's actually the expert there. If I look at um, how people behave on our platform, I can actually tell what they're looking for. And I will tell you, nobody likes their commute. Everybody's attracted by the idea of remote work, um, if they can get it. Of course, many workers don't have that option. If you work at a hotel, you're probably not working remote. Um, but on the left-hand side, what you see is how tight the labor market was for uh, remote work. And it got nice and tight. There were lots of jobs. That's the line going up relative to the number of um, applicants. And then it started coming down um, last year. And so employers are pulling back on their offers of fully remote work. If your job is, let's say, non-remote, like you need to come in, maybe it's hybrid, or you need to come in all the time, there are still, it's, a little, it's still quite tight. So there's a, just a difference. And I think the only thing to take away here, and it's almost not even shown on this graph, is that employers are retracting remote work very aggressively. There are fewer and fewer job openings of remote work. Remote work used to be about 20% of the jobs on our 14 million jobs on our platform. 20% were remote. That's actually pretty high, because the pre-pandemic number was about 6%. So we went up to 20% in 2021. We've come down. We're now about 12%. Tech is still the most remote friendly. Um, but the ones that are declining the fastest, where employers are like, you need to come back in the office, are professional services, admin and support services, things like that. So people back in the big office towers, if you can get, get them in the building. Um, most CEOs will tell you they're getting 20 30% occupancy, though. They're not pleased about the fact that most people don't want to come in five days a week. We can talk about that. Um, last, I'm going to take a hard right turn now and talk about what we see in terms of AI. This is really a muse bouche. So I can look across 39,000 skills and say, what are the AI skills? And what I had my team do is say, what are the fastest growing skills? So these are not the top 10 skills in the AI space that employers are looking for or that workers say they have. These are the fastest growing ones. And I just want you to look not at the whole eye chart, but look at the top right. The black bolded skills are all related to Gen I, and they are now, in the past 12 months, the fastest growing skills. They are not the most popular. The most popular is still AI, ML, something called Pandas, which I don't even know what that is. I guess I'm too old to know all the new software. But these are the fastest growing. So you have classification, question answering, computer vision, which is all about like taking images, natural language processing. These are all related to generative AI. Um, so I just want to kind of point that out. I'm going to stop here. Come sit down, and we can have a conversation, but just to give you a little sense of it. So thanks a lot. Good. <laughs> Great. So thanks very much, Karen. So the first theme we want to talk about, I was, wasn't sure quite how sensitive this, sensitive this was, but it's clearly a, the big theme in tech, which is the tech slowdown. So you've seen in the news there's been reports as pretty much every tech firm has been cutting headcount, has been laying workers off. I guess Karen's gone through some numbers here. The question I'm going to go first to John, then to Eric, and then come back to Karen, is how much of this is just a temporary readjustment? We know tech hired a lot in the pandemic. So actually, the levels of employment are way above they were back in 2020, versus is it a temporary readjustment where there's some omen of some bigger, more permanent shift? So why don't we go to John first? Thanks. So I think that's a complicated question. First of all, I should ask all the economists in the room what the GDP is going to be for the year, and then we can tell you <laughs> something about it. But I think you have to look at it in context. For Alphabet, Q4 of 2021 was a record-breaking year, fastest growth in roughly five years. Um, and there was an enormous competitive race on to get talent, particularly AI talent, as Karen's pointed out. So you were in this mad hiring situation, right? And then all of a sudden, and everybody thought, pandemic's over, economy's going to the roof. Um, and, and then, of course, the slowdown occurs. And I think that, so the, really what's going to happen in, I think, the rest of this year will depend a lot on what happens with the economy and how quickly it rebounds. Eric? Yeah, for sure, I John, I second your comment. I think, in my view, I would say, as uh, Karen just pointed out, 
I think it's a temporary problem because I'd like to take a step back to understand what's the problem, what had happened obviously over the past two years, especially in the high tech industry, we overhired. Right. right. In take Zoom, for example, we had no choice. And prior to COVID, we had a little bit over 2,000 employees. During COVID, we had to deal with uh, unprecedented traffic, and we hired more than 6,000 employees. Right. right. But now, after the COVID crisis is over, for sure, it's not sustainable. Right. However, even if, unfortunately, we just announced 15% you know, headcount reduction, we're also going to rehire a lot of engineers with uh, yeah, you know, expertise. Right. That's why I say it's the short term. In the long run, I think the high tech is still, you know, I'm very, very optimistic about the long term growth. Yeah. Thank you. Karen? Yep, I would agree. I think I do think the way you go into a recession is the way you come out of it. So if you go in sharp and quickly, you come out the same way. Um, and I think if we gradually slide into kind of a malaise, whether it's a slump, a slowdown, or a very modest short lived recession, I think we'll kind of gradually come out of it. Tech specifically, I think that's a different story. I think we'll get used to the new water line and, and uh, rates, which has been quite high. If you remember, we just talked about going up 400, 450 basis points in a year. Um, that really hurt tech too, and I think we'll get used to a new water level and then we'll kind of grow from there. So I'm actually more optimistic in the long run for tech, um, but I do think generally it's gonna be a slow recovery. No wonder you are Stanford undergraduate. More <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> Thank you, John. So. Yeah, and the, you know, I think we're going to talk about this AI revolution, but this is real, and it is going to lead to real growth in the tech companies as this technology replaces more and more of yes. traditionally hand-done work by people. Yeah. And they're going to look for different, I'm sorry I'm jumping in here, yeah. but they're going to look for a different composition of workers, maybe to your point. They mm -hmm. may be rotating out certain types of engineers for more AI-intensive talent. So it's hiring, it's just different hiring. I mean, one of the... I'm glad to hear it. One of the striking things, actually, I was talking this morning to a journalist from the Wall Street Journal about, they were asking me why Britain's productivity and growth performance has been so bad. And there's obviously Brexit, and I won't get into all of that. But then I was like, well, who are you comparing it to? And they're comparing it to the US. And I was like, well, Britain doesn't look great, and it's been struggling for a while, but actually it's not dramatically worse than Europe. And in fact, if you flip it around, the US has been incredibly impressive over the last 20, 30 years. And if you look at what's driven a lot of US growth, a large amount of it's come from tech, actually. And then that, in turn, has actually interestingly spun off elite university. I mean, John's time at Stanford has been superb, but you know, some other lesser universities like MIT, Harvard, you know, all of these places, it's quite phenomenal as, as a Brit to look and, you know, we're always told America is this land of opportunity. You see one industry is driving so much of the aggregate growth. So move, changing topics. Talk a bit about AI. So one of my colleagues here, Eric Binjolson, is, is a perennial optimist. Uh, and is always, you know, another, I guess that's why he came to Stanford to become even more optimistic. So he's always very positive about AI. And for a while, it's, it's clearly been growing for 20, 30 years. I remember as a kid, actually, in Japan in the 90s, they had a build. In the 80s, there was a big AI thing that kind of came and went. Obviously, ChatGPT raised it dramatically in the public consciousness, and it's now everywhere. You know, amusingly, I put into ChatGPT uh, the titles, asked it to write essays based on titles of some of my own research papers. And what you get out looks like an incredibly confident 13-year-old. It's like, you know, really well-written <laughs> stuff. It looks great, but it seems to have invented papers that I, you know, I and others never wrote. So it's, it kind of splices it together. And it was like a credible paper it could have existed. I mean, it's amongst academics. Maybe we'll start to pick up citations for papers we didn't even write, thanks to AI, which will be a, uh, you know, we're happy to take all citations wherever they come from. Um, so with that positive spin in mind, I was going to ask actually about the impact of uh, AI for the, for the tech industry. Why don't, I, why don't I start with Eric and then we we'll go to Karen and then uh, move to John. Yeah, I think uh, I'm extremely excited about AI. I think, you know, several years ago, we all talked about AI, especially in the high tech industry. And we talked about it many years and uh, you know, I think nobody can truly you know, feel the power of AI right? until ChatGPT. Right. I think uh, is I think it's real. I think uh, if you ask me, you know, last year, you know, what's my concern? I'm uh, very concerned about this year's overall economy, right? Given the you know, looming, you know, the recession and uncertainty. But now with AI, I'm uh, very optimistic. I think you know, even there's a recession, it'd be very shallow recession. The reason why AI is going to drive everything forward. You know, take you know our business for example. We had to you know slash the cost. However, we have to look at every services, every you know uh, product and you know, features. How to leverage AI, 
and how to reinvest, right? And similar to any other companies, right? Very similar to what we were facing back in 1995, 1996, right. you know, when internet, the first wave of internet revolution, right? And everyone got to look at how we can leverage internet, right, to change our business. I think the same is happening now, how to leverage AI. Right? Almost every company, no matter traditional company or the high-tech company, how to leverage AI to completely change productivity, improve your product, and that's the opportunity. At the same time, also the challenge. But again, this time is real. By the way, by the way, the OpenAI, the, the, the founder, Sam, also is a Stanford undergraduate. So competing against John, your company, Google now. So anyway, so I'm very, very optimistic. This is a true opportunity for all of us, you know, how to leverage AI and to improve people's lives. I'll give one example, right? You know, every day I'm doing the self-reflection. So I look at what I can do differently if I start over. So I look at how many meetings I joined, what I did, how many emails, a lot of things. Every day I spend a lot of time. Imagine we leverage AI. You know, in the evening, leverage AI, just give me a five minutes of summary <laughs> about what I did today, what I should do next, tomorrow, right? Yeah. That's the power of AI. It's real now, so. That sounds very, uh, that sounds amazing. No email every day. Okay, yeah. Karen? <laughs> that would sound lovely, no yeah. email. Um, yeah, I, I kind of share your view, Eric. I do think that like AI as a, as a partner, as a co-pilot to, to you, um, helping you become more productive is the best version of it. Um, and that's what's exciting. I think, um, and I'll say this as a black American woman, like I have, I'm scared too. I'm like, I wanna make sure it's inclusive. I wanna make sure that it's not trained on weird bias data that results in weird biased you know, output. So garbage in, garbage out, or quality in, quality out. So I, I have incredible excitement, and then also some trepidation or caution about like, I hope it works out really well. And I guess as an economist, I think, well, there's winners and losers always. And yes, there will be jobs that are displaced, and there will also be jobs created. So I think the responsibility is to kind of have a responsible AI approach. And I'll stop here, but just say that like, having this opportunity to see all the creation of productivity and growth is great, but also recognizing there'll be people who who do kind of decide to tap out and are like, I'm not gonna bother learning AI. I'm, as Aishikul said earlier, I'm a mature worker and I just can't be bothered. And they're gonna just get displaced perhaps as opposed to retraining. So how do we think about keeping people engaged in labor force and not feeling they have to just tap out because technology moved too quickly? And that's the question I, I sort of ask myself. Yeah. So, first of all, when, when we say AI, what we really mean is machine learning. That's the big breakthrough. That's really the breakthrough that's occurred because the other AI approaches have not had the kind of big breakthrough that machine learning has. The thing to remember is this is less than 10 years old. There were two big breakthroughs, the winning AlphaGo where a computer program won Go against the world's Go champion and a, a thing called CNN, which was the image recognition breakthrough, where a, a big leap in terms of being able to do high quality image recognition, which of course is behind self-driving cars and all these other technologies. Right. So it's a real shift, because instead of writing code, you basically create programs with data, and you learn from the data. Now, there is no truth detector in any of these things, as Nick pointed out. There is no truth detector. In fact, it's impossible to build a truth detector. So if you train this thing on garbage, you get garbage out. And what they're doing to address the, the issue that Karen raised is they're using what's called reinforcement learning. So if you take ChatGPT, they sit down. Thousands of people sit down, run things through ChatGPT, and then say, no, ChatGPT, do not say that. And they fine tune the model so that it doesn't make mistakes, doesn't generate toxicity. And you'd say, well, geez, isn't that a lot of people tuning these things? Sure, but if you have a million users, okay, you can afford to have a few thousand people right. sitting down hand tuning this. We're in the early, early stages of this revolution, less than a decade. But think the invention of the digital computer, the transistor, recombinant DNA, I think machine learning is gonna be right up there with the, those kinds of things in terms of long-term impact. It's, a, it, 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 um, it's an amazing observation. I remember this, that famous quote by Robert Solow going back, I think it was the 1987, the New York Times. He said, you see computers everywhere except in the productivity statistics. And there's been this 20, 30, 40 year lag where it's computers are everywhere, but 
American growth rates and productivity growth rates have been declining. And maybe now, finally, we're about to see, you know, the rev I hope so. This was, this was actually a theme of, uh, with Patrick Collison and in one of the earlier CEPA summits about seven, eight years ago that growth is, 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 is declining. Um, so I was going to change topics to something else which has been a long personal interest, which is work from home. So I, I've been working on working from home for about 20 years. Up until like March 2020, it was an amazingly boring, quiet, backwater topic. You know, whenever you try and talk to people about it, their eyes would like glaze over and they'd start falling asleep. The joke was back then, you know, it's really hard because the three great enemies of work from home are the bed, the television, and the refrigerator. And someone falls <laughs> victim to one of them and, you know, they have to go back to work. Obviously, everything changed in March 2020. And we basically had a mass national experiment. People were forced home. As it turns out, they were forced home initially by the pandemic for about a year and a half. And then the very tight labor markets kind of kept it running for a while. And so you get to the, you know, the situation now, we've basically been kind of working mostly hybrid, some fully remote for two and a half years. And it looks like it's really stuck. So to give you some numbers, 5% of days of Americans will work from home pre-pandemic. That exploded to about 60% in the peak. And it's bottoming out to about 25% now. So it looks like now we're kind of in the new normal. I wanted to ask, how do you think work from home is going to change the tech industry, I guess, change society more generally? And I'm going to start with Eric and then move across again. Thanks. Yeah, so yeah, you're so right. Back to March 2020, actually, I remember, I remember on peak day, I had a total 19 Zoom calls. <laughs> I'm so tired of Zoom at that time. <laughs> and, uh, we all were. But even today, actually, a little bit of selfish view, I want everyone to go back at home, work remotely, to use Zoom. But however, I don't think that's sustainable. And we know actually prior to COVID, we all work from uh, work at office, it works, right? right? During the COVID, we all work from uh, home, it also works. But today, I think uh, new norm is uh, hybrid work. Hybrid work, I think, is very tricky. And uh, every business has a sort of a different definition of hybrid work, right? You know, how often do you want to employ common office? Is that optional or is that mandatory? Uh, one day or two days, you know, a, a lot of issues. And uh, I think uh, fundamentally, you know, the, the, the problem is, as you pointed out, right, it's employer and employee, they disagree from something. Right. As a CEO, for sure, I want an employee to come, come back to office. But unfortunately, I cannot make it a mandatory, right, for now. And uh, the biggest problem, I would say, is a hybrid challenge will be the, the, the creativity, the innovation. The reason why you, you think about the innovation, right? Take a Zoom, for example. Quite often, you know, maybe John Kerry and we are in the office, we have a topic, right? And, uh, you know, we, we have whiteboard, we debate, we give each other very honest feedback, right? Hey, this is not right, this is right, and with different background, very likely we can work together to come up with some very cool ideas. But during the hybrid work, in you know, some of them might have joined over Zoom, right? Everyone, the problem is maybe this is still the Zoom problem. I think everyone, tends to be very nice to each other, right? Not to mention a feature called you touch up your appearance, right? Everyone's so nice. You might have a different opinion. <laughs> I don't want to say no, right? Because of that, I think quite often when you have some ideas, you want to get a feedback from your peers. Right. They may not give you a very honest candidate feedback. Yeah. That's why it will have a negative impact, I would say, to the creativity, to the innovation. That's why you have to figure out a way to let the employee come by the office. Maybe you know, you know, far from one day or two days, but ultimately to let employ everyone work from home remotely, I just do not think it's sustainable, even if I like Zoom so much. So. <laughs> I like to zoom. Um, I like that little feature. You could touch yourself up. It was almost like giving you a full makeover. <laughs> yeah. Press that button. You'd be in your pajamas. Um, so I'll I'll say this. I I. Um, I mentioned earlier I saw these statistics where women kind of just disappeared from our, like, any engagement in the workplace. And I'm not exaggerating if I say it was like two, three, four percentage points drop in women being engaged in the workforce, changing jobs, responding to recruiters, looking for jobs. They just kind of faded um, at the beginning of the pandemic, and they've come back. Um, and there is an element of a desire for flexibility that I think work from home is a proxy for. And the flexibility can be where are you working from, what days are you working from, what hours are you working from, maybe how much autonomy you have over the work you're doing. Um, and I think everybody sort of fell in love with 
that greater flexibility. So I do think there's some element of work from home that will always be available, especially if you are doing a job that is in high demand and your employer wants to retain you, they will find a way to create flexibility for you. That's what we see. Um, we also see that when, I'll just give an example, when people come onto our platform to look for jobs, women are 24% more likely to look at remote jobs. I think it's because they want the flexibility. And black women and Latina women are like 36% more likely to look at remote jobs. So there's something about flexibility. I know I'm taking us off topic of remote. Um, but let's go back to tech. Tech has long wanted to have a more inclusive workforce or more diverse mm -hmm. workforce. And they were able to do that by hiring remote mm -hmm. workers all across the country. Um, they didn't have to find all of their talent in San Francisco or Seattle. So I do think that there's some upsides to the remote, and I want to like, underscore all the downsides you mentioned. It's harder to be creative, it's harder to connect with people, you don't have the cultural ties. So there's a, a yin and yang there, and I, um, I'm a little torn. I think remote has some benefits, but I also run a team where I wish everybody would come in every day too. Mm. So. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's been an interesting lesson. I mean, the, the one thing we immediately noticed was new employees didn't feel part of the culture and the heartbeat of the company in the same way when they started on, on Zoom. And, and that's kind of faded as people have started to come into the office. I think everybody's gonna go to a hybrid model of some sort. And uh, focusing on Karen's point about flexibility, one of the things a lot of, a lot of groups down at Google have done, we've done here at the university, is say, okay, we're gonna shove all the meetings between 11 and two. So you can, you're guaranteed you can miss at least one part of the rush hour craziness in the valley. And that helps get more flexibility, lets people um, engage with family issues or other things they need to deal with. Um, the, the one thing that's completely changed is I will never get on a plane for a three hour meeting in Washington DC <laughs> unless it's in the White House. <laughs> Yeah, I wish I got invited to three-hour meetings uh, in the White House, but, you know, maybe <laughs> yeah. one day. Hopefully for the right reasons, too. Yeah. Um, so, Nick, sorry, I would like to add one more thing. Yeah, yeah, I think ahead. the technology can truly empower the future remote work. Today is the biggest problem with technology already, because we are all human beings. We need a social interaction. Yeah. A Zoom course has no social interaction. Yeah. But in the future, imagine with AR, VR, maybe AI technology, right? you know, feel like you and I, no matter where we are, yeah. you know, we use Zoom, I can shake your hands, Give a heart, yeah. and I also can enjoy the smell. You can coffee. do it here if you want. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think in the I, future. I, yeah, I think Eric's exactly right on this point. I think there's a real a place where there's a giant opportunity. Meetings that are mixed, where some people are in the conference room and some people are on Zoom, those are the ones where an AR, VR kind of situation would dramatically make it much, much better. Everybody then could feel like they were in the room as opposed to those people on the screen feeling isolated from the people who are in the room. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to make a couple of comments. One is exactly on what Eric, you were saying that te technology is hugely important. So one study I've been doing, which is scraping uh, with Mihai Kondrano, who's here, and this, with some various co-authors, but Mihai is in the audience, scraping the patents that come out from the US Patent and Trademark Office every month. So there are thousands of patents that are put out every month. You scrape for how many of these mention work from home, remote work, telework, et cetera. You require it to mention three plus times to get rid of kind of superfluous random mentions. That thing is flat and it starts to really take yeah. off at the beginning of the pandemic and rise, rise, rise. Why this is hugely important is market size effects are kicking in. So before the pandemic, 5% of days of work from home. It's a moderate market for technology, but it's not enormous. Suddenly the pandemic happens, that goes up fivefold. Every software company, hardware company, venture capital firm I talk to, startup, is really focused on it. That's gonna mean dramatically faster improvements in technology, and that's gonna drive working from home itself. There's a virtuous feedback. If I think about when I first started working on this 20 years ago, it was like telephone calls. I remember freeconferencecall.com. I don't know if anyone else used that, it was okay. <laughs> Definitely wasn't as good as Zoom. And then you were emailing files. Uh, I mean, Zoom was 2011. Cloud, Dropbox, all of these things were about 2010, 2011, 2012. So if you thought of the, if we tried to work remotely in 2005, it's like, phone calls and emailing is horrible. So one of the things when I get asked is about the future of work from home, I think there's kind of a Nike swoosh, which is there'd be a little bit of a drop in the short run as some people get tougher, the recession kicks in, maybe a mild recession. But in the long run, I think it's pretty clearly up. So if you're looking five, certainly 10 years out, there will be more rather than less 
work from home now because the technology is going to get so much better. Mm -hmm. But when I had lunch at Zoom, mm -hmm. Eric was saying, like, we're developing something that you put your hand into the screen and your hand comes out from the screen on the other side. And I was like, <laughs> really? I, I, like, I was like, I, you can never tell when you talk to Silicon Valley CEOs. It's like, are you being yeah. serious? <laughs> like, uh, he didn't say anything, so I still so, don't know. So it's more like we talked about AI 10 years ago. Today, <laughs> AI is, is real, right? So, so I think it's very possible. So, and then, the other thing I was going to say, the other thing I hear is fully remote, get back to Karen's slides, is kind of dying off. So fully remote, uh, it, so as in you never come into the office is really hard. The things I've heard repeatedly from execs, managers is, it's, as John said, it's problematic for mentoring, it's problematic for creativity, and it's problematic for, for building culture. And interestingly enough, if you look at Stanford students, our undergrads, they don't really want to do it because they want to go in, they want to be social, they want to get mentored. And also, they're typically, you know, six of them living in some small apartment. Like, no one wants to work from home in their bedroom. So how are you going to figure it out? Hybrid seems to be pretty much where everyone's heading. And if you want one vanilla recipe, it seems to be. I mean, we're, we're on the pre-call. We're all kind of in alignment here. It's classically something like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday yeah. in the office. Everyone wants to work from home Friday. I mean, you know, I'm guessing everyone's here. I don't know what people's works think is going on. But, uh, and work from home Monday. And, this is, these kind of things you need, like I saw Steve, it was great to see Steve Cohagen. You, there's a lot of these things, it's so nice to connect with old friends, co meet, contact people. This kind of activity, social stuff, is much better done in person. So hybrid seems to be more productive for meetings, presentations, events. It seems like Monday, Friday is actually more productive for quiet work. So I think the future for folks like us is very hybrid. Interestingly, Stanford, I don't know, John, how much you're still in contact with this, but the staff at Stanford are now coming in typically two days a week. So we in much of Silicon Valley and uh, following the same recipe. So I'm going to ask one more question. Can I just add something? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. To, to just a little factoid from our data, we see exactly what you're mentioning, Nick. Um, so we can look at our data by generation, generational cohort, and um, some of the very interesting things that have been talked about today, we've actually seen in our data. And so to your point about who wants to come in? Well, the younger generation actually does want to come in. They want to be mentored. They want, they're very transactional about their career. They're not at all in the basement playing video games. They are like, what are you doing for me? How are you investing in me? Are you training me for the next role? And so they want to be in. They also live in smaller houses. So if you live in a really nice house in Palo Alto or Atherton, maybe you're happy to work from home. But if you don't and exactly. you're sharing an apartment, you're happy to be in. So young people come in. Uh, more mature workers will come in. It's that donut hole of I have kids and aging parents and right. orthodontist appointments, and those are the folks that are like least likely to come in. Um, so, And then the last question may be very, very different on this idea of like where's tech going is thinking about having international teams. Right. So um, this technology that Zoom you know, enables people to connect, even though we haven't solved the time zone problem, um, still means that you can have very, very international teams. And I think that's also an element of the future of work that we haven't really touched on. Great. I'm going to ask one final question before we go to open, which is, open question, which is kind of the future of Silicon Valley. So the tech industry has been very focused on Silicon Valley. It's kind of born and being grown up in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, Obviously, Stanford University is probably the largest landowner in Silicon Valley, so there's not any self-interest at all in this question. But I you know, wondered, what do you see about how much the Silicon Valley will be dominant over the next kind of 10, 20 years in terms of technology? And I, I, again, why don't I go from the, the reverse direction? Why don't I go to okay, John first? Okay, good question. So I think you know, over the years, there have been many attempts to clone the valley. I think the best of them may get a C plus, B minus. They haven't worked really well. On the other hand, the valley may cause its own slowdown and demise if it can't deal with its housing and its transportation problem. We are going to create opportunities for other people because young people can't afford to live here. They can't live with a two hour commute. We need to, that's a problem for the local community to solve. It's up to the leadership in the valley to really solve that problem. I think if we don't solve that problem, we will slowly grow competition despite the fact that this is the talent magnet, you know, between Stanford and, and Berkeley, you've got the best private university in the entire world and the best public university in the entire world, right here in the Bay Area. So, so it's a tremendous, and they, the talent we bring in, I remember many years ago, many years ago, uh, Andy Grove said something really interesting. He said, you know, Stanford does great research, but it brings in incredible talent 
that then goes out into the valley and right. really fertilizes the valley. And I think that's important to remember that we'll continue to bring it, assuming we don't have gigantic visa problems, we'll continue to bring in that talent and, and ensure it. But we're gonna have to solve our own logistical problems and if we don't solve those, eventually people are gonna move to places like Texas or North Carolina or, or Arizona or other places like that. So I think John just gave the good, the, the actually root cause problem and challenge for us. I'll just um, give a sense of what we see in our data. Um, so of course, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of people leaving San Francisco and Seattle and Portland and New York, and everyone in New York went to Florida, according to LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> and a lot of people in uh, San Francisco went to Sacramento and Bend, Oregon. I was like, I was, I'm an East Coaster. I was like, what, what is Bend, Oregon? It sounds very nice. I looked it up. Um, and a lot of people went to non-tax non-income tax states, right, or low tax states, make a lot of sensible things. What we see now is a lot of people are coming back to San Francisco, New York, Seattle. Um, and so talent is net on net moving back towards these anchors. That doesn't give you, a, I don't disagree with your long-term analysis, but we are seeing people kind of coming back and I don't ever bet against New York um, or, I'm actually a fan of San Francisco, so I think it'll come back too. I think, Nick, your question itself may not be accurate. It's not a 10 or 20 years. It should be 120 years. Is that right? 100 or 200 years. No. I think Silicon Valley You're is- You're older a, than you look, Eric. I, I'm impressed. I, <laughs> I think Silicon Valley is, is, is worldwide innovation, innovation center. It will continue to be a worldwide innovation center for many, many years, probably more than 100 years. You know, take my personal experience, for example. I moved to Silicon Valley in 1997. And within the several months, I feel like already part of Silicon Valley. The reason why you look at the, the, the culture here, right? You know, truly, you know, uh, embrace, you know, diversity, right? And no matter where you are coming from, a lot of leaders here, mm -hmm. they are so proactive to try to help you out. This right. is the culture. And also look at the density of capital, talents, and also not to mention weather here as well. I think all the problems, John, you said, very valid. But whenever we are facing a problem, we got to know one thing is, either one company or one leader, a, co a companies or multiple leaders, they are going to stand out in Silicon Valley to figure a new solution. AI is a great example, right? I think that's why I'm very, very optimistic. There's nowhere in, in the world it can replicate the success of Silicon Valley. The key is the culture here, and plus several other things, you know, John, you, you said. That's why I think I'm extremely optimistic. Even if, for the time being, some people might move out to other cities or states, but I think I, don't, I, I truly believe that's a short-term problem. In the future, it's still very, very you know, bright. It, I, I totally agree. And it is striking having taught at Stanford for many years and obviously grown up. I've been through many universities over the years, both as a student and taught. The undergrads and the MBAs and the grad students here is just a dramatically higher rate of enthusiasm for startups, studying their own things. Like the GSB has the, you know, the startup garage where all of the MBAs have right. to start up their mm -hmm. own projects. I'm, you know, I'm advising one now. Lots, I have multiple undergrads that I know. The last thing I heard of them a few years ago when they're saying they're graduate. I looked them up and it's you know, a company of 50, 60 people. I, that, you know, it, it, it's, it's amazing. It's a very different ethos. And as an anecdote, my dad, who's now retired but started up, he was a medical researcher and started up two biotech firms, kind of small companies. Both cases, despite being in London and based in Imperial College, got chunks of funding from the Valley, and he came out here. And it was it was very striking that the Valley both has the money to go in. And um, by the way, you know, back to the Stanford, I think you look at all of the universities. I truly believe, in terms of uh, entrepreneurial atmosphere, Stanford by far the best. Right? That's another reason why Silicon Valley will do very well in the future. So yeah, and you know it's been a. I mean, look historically when I arrived at Stanford doing computer work, if you wanted to talk to the leadership in the computer industry, you got on a plane, and you flew to Boston or you flew to New York. You were going to IBM or you're going to DEC. Then things changed, right? And all of a sudden they're coming out to see us, and so that that's what we've got to keep. And it's as Eric said, it's about this innovation, it's about risk taking, and it's about talent. And those are the things that make the Valley really strong. And if we can keep that and solve some of our little logistical problems, we'll be just fine. Yeah. Or you Zoom. Don't forget, I'm also- <laughs> Zoom is good, Zoom is good. I'm also Stanford alumni yeah, too. Good. So. Zoom is good. And we're gonna use more Zoom, because I think even 
if the Valley maintains its leadership, there's going to be more outsourcing of various kinds of jobs and tasks. I mean, there's going to be a lot of AI training that has to, where people are going to have to sit down and do it. That's probably not something where you're going to hire a workforce here in the Valley to do. You're going to outsource that. Exactly. Great. So why don't we go? Uh, someone was very fast in the corner there with their hand up. That was a, an Olympic, like, speed raise. <laughs> First off, thank you. This was an excellent and really wide-ranging discussion, so thanks for your views here. Um, there was a little bit of an informal theme in the morning's discussion that geopolitics is back in a big way, and wanted to ask your opinion on that as far as you kind of think about the future of technology. Obviously, for you know Eric and Karen, you all are at firms that have been sort of caught up in sort of U.S.-China uh, technology competition in certain ways, and then obviously for Nick and John, as you kind of think about the future of innovation and productivity in a world where you know we are moving towards sort of technology decoupling between the U.S. and China. How, how do you think through the implications there? Thank you. Well, it is, it is I think, um, you know, the U.S. in terms of competitiveness, especially in tech, is going to face an interesting challenge. Um, in the past, you know, I'm old enough that I remember when we thought Japan was going to take over the entire semiconductor and the computer industry, and it didn't, uh, because it didn't have that kind of entrepreneurial, innovative culture. China absolutely has that entrepreneurial, innovative culture. So it will provide an interesting challenge. I think they, they're the only, uh, the only part of the world that can really challenge the US leadership in AI, for example. Um, so we'll see, we'll see. I think we're going to have to be on our game. We're going to have to play an A game to really be competitive. So I'll take the other side of that. I actually don't disagree, but I'll, I'll add that um, we um, at LinkedIn can see where a lot of AI talent lives. And there's an awful lot of AI talent in India as well. Yeah. That's a very fast growing economy. Just even in terms of nominal rates, so not real, not inflation adjusted, but just nominally growing at sometimes 18%, 11%, 15% a year. That's very fast nominal growth. So a lot of people very focused on tech. Um, I think India is another opportunity, geographical area um, that's I, I, I consider it an opportunity, not a challenge. Um, and I think we at LinkedIn take a very global approach to the workforce, so everything feels inclusive. And I understand America's you know, going to be thinking about their labor force and their talent here in the borders. But I just see an explosion of AI talent happening across Asia beyond China as well. Yeah, I think Karen has second or comments. I think uh, you know, I, I, I feel like almost every country in the world you know, trying to learn more from America, how to kind of a little bit more entrepreneurial, right? For, for, for the country, for all the talents. But that's why when it comes to new technology, right? As long as any country tries to be more entrepreneurial, I think they probably can catch up, right? However, in terms of creativity, I still think by far, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, we are we ahead of any other countries in terms of, uh, you know, creativity for any new ideas, new technology, I think uh, that's kind of an advantage. And because this is it's not easy for, for any other country trying to, to catch up to, you know, more like a business to business. You know, try, you know it's hard to learn you know, from other business to, care, to copy their culture. But you can copy technology, you can copy the product, but culture is very hard to copy. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I feel like, uh, it's, uh, you know, that's why back to the your, 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 your previous question, I think the, the innovation center is still the, the sending body. By the way, back to the mission attention, I think, you know, in my view, extension, you know, is still like a, the short-term thing. The reason why, you look at this, also look at the business. The biggest problem will be, you have a problem. The problem is hidden there. You don't know until it completely explodes and, and becomes something not manageable. Today, the problem is already there on the table. There are so many smart people, right? Probably they can figure out a solution. As long as the table, the, the problem is already there on the table, I feel, very optimistic. As long as we do not hide the problem, I think that's fine. So. Yeah, but Patricia. But. Hi. Hi. Thank you all. Uh, I'm, I'm Patricia. I'm an undergrad here. I have the opportunity to take Nick Bloom's uh, labor economics class. So we get to talk about all this like twice a week. Um, <laughs> so I'm very excited to ask you all experts in the field about this. Um, so, you know, we. 
in the class we've covered, you know, the rise of computers and how like a lot of tasks have shifted to like, you know, non-routine cognitive tasks and like by and large there's been, you know, an increase in empl employment and jobs created, but there's been certain losers for that. Uh, I, I have a lot of, my, I'm an econ major, but a lot of my friends are CS and they're very worried about chat GPT. It's replacing a lot of like junior level development for code and it's, as it gets better, it's only going to replace more entry level positions. So I guess I kind of want to ask very, very, very earnestly, and I am a Stanford undergrad, so I'm very optimistic in, in the rise of productivity we'll have. At the same time though, there is, you know, things that give us conniptions and uh, caution. So who do you think the losers will be in the American economy as this AI takes off? And then from your perspectives and the firms you work at, how are you all preparing for this, you know, radical shift that's going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> I, I can hard, start. That's a I'm hard not the question, so we're all looking at Yes, the economist. Is, <laughs> I, I, I'm having to take a stab and okay, buy you some step. time. Yeah, okay. Take a stab. So, um, historically, losers of big technological transitions are older workers because they don't take up the new technology and learning and because we have a system um, where we say you should finish all your learning by age 24 and then go off and just be smart for the rest of your career, which makes no sense. We should be doing lifelong learning. So that's historically one of the losers or slowest beneficiaries of technological change, just immediately in terms of job. There are often, like as you can imagine, ancillary benefits just from better productivity, better technology makes everything better for all of us and improves our standard of living. That's the Fed economist argument that I, I learned growing up. Um, but the other, the other set of folks who you need to kind of look out for are people who don't have um, the opportunity to acquire skills so that their job, if you think of a job as a group of tasks, you, it's fine if AI takes over half my tasks, I'd be delighted. And leave me the interesting stuff, the anomalies, the, the kind of like weird, you know, abstract thinking. Um, if, it, if I don't have to cull through a lot of stuff looking for data and it's all just organized for me, that's fine. Um, so I think the trick is people who don't have the opportunity to acquire skills, that let them use technology as a complement to them, to their work, and instead it just becomes a substitute for them. And I know that's an easy answer and you've probably read it as you studied, but that's what we need to think about is how do you upskill people so that they can all use the technology as their co-pilot as opposed to feeling like they're getting threatened or replaced by it. I can, I can, I can give you a, 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 you know, if you ask a professor, you'll get a research paper answer, but I give you, there's actually a really great paper that looks at this. So someone called Mike Webb, uh, who is a Stanford PhD student in true Stanford style. He's actually now trying to found his own university. So I don't know, you know, we'll see many years. This Webb University yeah. obviously worked out, but we'll, we'll, we'll wait. But so Mike Webb's paper was looking at this question. So what he did is he looked at patents and he broke patents down, the text into mm. verb noun mm. pairs. And verb noun pairs might be a patent for lift boxing boxes or, you know, process code or deal with invoices or make forecasts. And he looked at those verb noun pairs, he used synonyms to try and group them together, and then looked at something called the Dictionary of Occupational Terminology, which defines what jobs do, and tried to match them up. And what he found basically, which is not that surprising, was really interesting. If you look at robotics patents, they tend to be very intensive in activities that low paid people do. So if you looked at the intensity of salary, robots, it was right at the bottom. So basically people at the bottom 10 or 20% pay, that's what robotics patents tend to do. And so robotics are replacing basically mm -hmm. low-end jobs mm -hmm. and actually pushing up inequality. If you look at software, it was a big hump shape. So software tended to be very intensive in people that were you know, payments, invoice processing, kind of repetitive, more desk jobs. If you look at AI, it was sloping up, 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 up. Thankfully, I guess for everyone in this room, it went down in the top you know, 5%, but it looks like it's very much focused on middle man yeah. junior middle management jobs. So I think in the short run, based on the technology behind AI, AI is doing the kind of activities that junior middle managers are doing. So the kind of things that I guess folks like here are doing at this stage, it wasn't you know, that very high end, but I think in some senses a promise is AI may reduce inequality. Yeah. So the one thing that's unusual about it, it may push down on, I mean, you have different views on that, but I think that's one of the outcomes that's going to happen. I mean, it's going to create growth, but I think may also reduce inequality. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, if you look at tech jobs and you'd say, uh, what's, what's been the trend in the software engineering industry over the last 20 years? It's been dramatic increases in productivity as you've moved to Python and Rust and these new languages. Dramatic. Have the number of programmers in the world gone down? No, it's gone up. 
because we've used this technology to do more ambitious things. Now, if you're somebody who writes marketing blurb, I think ChatGPT is coming for your job. If you put together, if you spend all your time making PowerPoint presentations, which is a productivity decrease in the world, <laughs> the PowerPoint chat GPT is coming and it's going to put your PowerPoint presentation. You just point it at the graphs, it puts it together, puts the headers on, does all the work, makes the fonts all pretty, finds some nice pictures to put on the slides. That's going to happen, I suspect. Yeah, John, you're right. Don't use the PowerPoint, they will be fine. So. <laughs> but anyway, I think my two cents, I think. Uh, I don't think anyone will be the loser. You know, take a junior software program, for, for example. Probably today they have a decent job. However, with AI, we will force them to become a senior software programmers, yeah. right? Guess what? Who's going to benefit? We all will benefit, right? We will further drive the productivity up, drive economy up, right? I think, uh, you know, with that, actually, as uh, Karen pointed out, everyone got to upskill their skill set, right, to become better. Right. Otherwise, probably, yeah, I can live with my junior software programmer job forever. Right. It's not good for society, not good for you as well. That's why AI with the new technology can drive the productivity up. That's why everyone will benefit, benefit from that. No one will be the loser yeah, in the long I mean, run. Maybe today, maybe that's the case. So. Yeah, I mean, nobody wants AI to be the judge in a courtroom, but you wouldn't mind having AI be your paralegal, right, where they're going to mm. pull all your documents together, but you still want the human inspiration, the abstract thinking, the nuance, that all is, yeah. I don't think, is going to be, you know, at threat, at risk anytime soon. And I'll just add that when we look across all the jobs, um, and our data kind of really only go back to 2015, 2016, but when we look across jobs and how they're changing, there's about 25% of the top skills needed for any job that are changing. Most of those skills are digital skills. So the reality is, is that, like, all jobs are changing, and as we always say, even if you're not changing your job, your job is changing on you. Um, so what I learned coming out of school is irrelevant now for people who are coming out of school. They are much better coders than I was coming out. No offense to Stanford. Um, and I, so I think that we all just have to kind of continuously upskill and recognize that. And that it, 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 you know, we, I don't think we should be afraid of AI. I think we need to embrace it and just kind of find ways to kind of let people keep learning. Great, uh, Peter. Th thank you. Uh, thanks for the fascinating discussion. So Nick mentioned the famous insight that productivity shows up everywhere but in the productivity st statistics. And when I look at my phone or you know, work on, look at my computer, there's, I can always work, but I could also watch Warriors highlights on YouTube uh, or read the Wall Street Journal and, and so on. So uh, does tech actually drive productivity, but it's hidden? So I guess that's the question for the economist. And then second, is there something about these AI tools that are more focused on productivity because there isn't a, a clear secondary uh, entertainment value uh, possibility in the AI. And, and maybe Eric or John or Karen, if you code, uh, the examples of computer coding with these co-pilot tools oh, wow. I'm hearing about are pretty spectacular uh, productivity enhancers. So thank you. Well, co-pilot, I, I think you're exactly right. It is a productivity enhancement. There's one small glitch. A copilot does not produce code that is always correct. So copilot is a tool that, uh, that was developed. It's a GitHub. You can get it. And it helps you write code. And so you say, you know, do a search in this array for some value, right? And it'll write the code for you. The problem is it doesn't really know that the code is correct. And one of the observations that's been made is programmers who think the code they get from copilot is right. And they incorporate it in there. So in some sense, you're going to have to have programmers are going to use these tools. But then they're going to have to go look at that code and make sure it really works right and it, it's correct. And that's going to actually require more upskilling by the programmers. They're going to, that's all. Reading somebody else's code and correcting it is a lot harder than correcting your own code. So that's going to require a different kind of proficiency from our programmers. That's the right answer. Totally. Yeah. We all agree. We yep. do on that one. Yeah. <laughs> on product, it's true that economists struggle to find, well, in some ways you struggle to find computers showing up in productivity numbers. I think, I think they're incredibly important for productivity. And I think the ways you find them is, one is it's taken a while. So productivity growth is, you know, I think is going to start to pick up. The other thing is look at the alternative. So the US productivity growth is dramatically higher actually than Europe. 
and the US has had the tech sector. And so I think a lot of it's taken time. If, you know, economists point to things like the steam engine and electrification. They took decades. The late Paul David, who just passed away, talked about how it took many decades mm -hmm. for new ideas. So if you think at steam power, uh, originally, I don't know how much people know, but factories used to be very small and t the kind of low floor plan, very tall, because you'd have one central uh, kind of power thing for which steam would go around or which you'd have um, water powered. Yeah. And when electricity came along, you could have a much lower, flatter factory with lots of motors spread throughout. But of course, you could have changed the buildings. And that takes, you know, decades and decades to do. So with computers, it's just a slow process of retraining. And, you know, for example, one of the sectors you saw at Fast is retail, actually. If you looked at some of the early effects of computerization, it's just been in retail and wholesale. So, yes, it's coming. You know, Robert Solo is a bit too early, but by now we can see it in the data. Yeah, but I, I think it's going to come pretty quickly. I think this is going to be the industrial revolution on steroids. That's what we're going to see because with these massive data centers and cloud computing, this technology is going to move very quickly um, through the, and change our lives. Yeah, and, and also, Nick, you look at the technology, you know, as a whole, right? Anytime, whenever there's a new technology born, it's always good for the, you know, for, for otherwise, you know, for everyone, right? If you do not be proactive to embrace a new technology, you will lag it behind. Yeah. As long as you're pro proactive, try to improve, guess what? Together, we will drive the productivity up. Every time, for any new technology, always like that, so. Right. Uh, Peter? Thank you for a great panel. Can you talk a bit about the implications for the field of education and also of credentialing? Yeah, so I, I think we have a problem in, in education. And a simple way to explain it is, think about a teacher with 25 kids in a math class. Eight of those kids are ready to move faster than the rest of the class. A bunch of them are in the middle, and the teacher can aim their, their work at, at those people. And eight of them are struggling. How does this teacher get around, support the students that are struggling, inspire the students who are ready to move quickly, and keep the middle of the class still intact? We haven't made great progress on technology and education because we haven't figured out how to make it adaptive to various learning things and challenges that students have. But the machine learning revolution is going to change this completely. You're going to take, you're going to learn from what, where students get stuck and what problems they have. And you're going to build an AI-based machine learning system that really gives individualized attention to students. And this is going to happen. I think we've already got little pieces of it for algebra courses and things like that. But it's going to race through the curriculum. It's not going to eliminate that teacher. Because the human touch is still important, especially for inspiring students that are disadvantaged. It's really important. But you can make that teacher much more effective. You can amplify their ability to be a great teacher. I'll add on to that if I can just really quickly in terms of education. Um, I actually think that the university system is pretty archaic. Um, I mean, it, it's a great one. It was created thousand, I don't know, I went to Oxford. It's like a thousand years old at least, right? Um, but it's pretty archaic. And I think that there's an opportunity to figure out how do we let people learn through their whole lives. And I'm not sure if your question was specifically AI uh, related, but I think John did a great job at answering it. But I'll just say generally, I would love to see education like step up a little bit. Um, when, we, when we see people on LinkedIn, they come and they do these learning courses. They want to learn in bite-sized chunks. They're like, I got 10 minutes. What can I do in 10 minutes of my time? Um, I'll come back next week and do another 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So they want bite-sized mm -hmm. chunks when it suits them, not like, hey, you should quit your job, mm -hmm. find $80,000, and then come spend a year or four years and, 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 and learn. Like, that just doesn't work for most people. So I am going to do my little call to action and get on my soapbox and say, I really think education needs to find a way to like engage people to learn at the price that they can afford and at the pace that they need to learn, which might be, I'm a working mom with three kids, and I need, I have exactly 30 minutes in the evening after their bedtime to do some learning. And then I get this credential. What do I do with it? Is it accepted anywhere? Is it stackable? Will it lead to a ladder of credentials that ultimately say you are now qualified to do X? So I was a, I was a, I don't know, customer call center operator, but now I can be a project manager and I can get a job with benefits and da da da. I don't think we've gotten there yet. 
Um, so that, I will get off the soapbox, but I really think education has a lot of work to do. Okay, Is it, yeah. Thanks a lot for a great panel. Um, I'm an economist, uh, specifically a macroeconomist, and one of our top skills is to uh, do a lot of uh, full servant and to pursue them very stubbornly. To do what? Uh, full servant. Uh, we sort of like are very Fools stubborn in, in, in pursuing some of these tasks which are um, very ungrateful because they're very hard to attain. Example, predicting GDP growth. And I want to ask you a question about the future. You invoked the um, solo paradox before. I'll invoke the solo equation from his growth model, and some of the economists here will, will be with me in terms of understanding the future of growth as being driven by technological innovation. And there's this big debate of whether that technological innovation is exogenous or endogenous. So you all three probably have a very optimistic view about the future of technology and its contribution to growth. My concrete question is, back in 1987, Solow's point was that there's this lag and unpredictability of the contribution of technology. And some people today, when they look at potential growth in the US, they wonder, well, where is that white knight from technology going to come to save the decline in GDP growth? So if you had to choose, has technological innovation become more or less predictive? And would that make our job as economists somewhat easier or harder? I'm happy to give a, a, a quick summary. So. Um, this goes back to a session we had a, a, in the summit a few years ago. So if you step back and look at the great s sweep of history, and we probably have better data for Britain than we do for the US, productivity growth was basically zero until the Industrial Revolution started in about 1750. So you look at people in 1700, they were not that much better off than people in 1000 AD. That's like 750 years, so it's 0.005%, very, very low. The Industrial Revolution starts, so that's the first change in the, you know, the first derivative. Productivity growth in the UK starts rising, 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 and it peaks in about 1950. So from the Industrial Revolution to 1950, that's kind of a couple of hundred years, it's improving. This is the era we call standing on the shoulders of giants. The previous innovations, electricity, you know, penicillin, all these things make future people more productive. By the time you get to 1950, what seems to take over is more the apple tree effect, the low hanging apples, the ideas have been plucked a bit, it's getting harder. So productivity growth in the UK and the US and Europe mostly is declining and it's been slowly trending down. It's now about 1% a year, it was about 3% in 1950. So the question is, are we going to have a third turning point? Up until a year ago, I'd say, look, we haven't had a turning point for almost 50 years, 70 years actually, no. Now, you know, as we discussed, it's possible we may now be on the cusp of a third turning point. AI may be so amazing that things may change. I wouldn't be surprised in five, 10 years, we suddenly start to see productivity growth take off. It has to be something pretty astounding, but you know, chat GPT, the third industrial revolution. So there's only been two turning points in the last several hundred years, but we might have a third one. If that doesn't happen, 1% is still great. To be clear, 1% productivity growth is amazing if you go back the several thousand years of humanity. It just looks bad compared to the heyday from the 50s onwards. But, and it's great if you're European. I was just on the phone this morning with some people in Britain wanting pr positive, not even like, you know, they just want positive numbers, not a negative sign in front of it. So, you know, the Americans are doing pretty well. So with that in mind, I think it's very hard to predict, but if there was ever a time in my lifetime when being optimistic about a point of inflection, it would actually be now. Yeah, yeah. I think, I, I agree with you. I mean, there, you know, the, this, you have to understand that this breakthrough in machine learning is coming after 40 years of pretty disappointing progress in AI, on AI that we didn't make. In fact, they're what they call AI winters, where people predicted we we're gonna do this, we we're gonna do that, <laughs> didn't, didn't get them. And then we made this breakthrough. Now, there's one little glitch on the horizon that we need to worry about, which is the future of the semiconductors, the semiconductor industry, the end of Moore's law. I mean, we've been so used to computing just getting cheaper and cheaper every single year. That's going to slow down some in the next decade or so, and that you know that could undermine some of the progress we're making. Yeah, yeah. I think back to you mentioned the GDP growth. I think it might be the ten important for us to look at how we measure GDP growth. We should not only focus on the, 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 the you know, quantity. We should you know we should focus on the quality. Mm -hmm. The new technology will I think will truly drive the economy forward, not only forward but also we make the GDP growth the quality much better with all the new AI technologies, right? I think that's a key. Otherwise, if you only focus on the GDP growth in terms of the quality, you feel like ah, 
it may not be there, but I think it's time to focus on quality now. I would just maybe add that I think sometimes, um, sometimes fiscal policy can be that seed that really fuels innovation. Um, and so to the extent that we see quality, fiscal policy that's invested in technology, that's a real opportunity to imagine that we're at a turning point. I would agree, I think AI could be this turning point. Um, I would just maybe point out, and I, I work at a tech company, that you know these innovations seem, you correct me if I'm wrong, but seem to be coming from companies and not from government I, I, absolutely. funding. And that might be a difference. You know, there's a long history of government funding in, yeah. that underlies the breakthroughs that have occurred. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, one of our colleagues, Fei-Fei Li, was the person who built ImageNet. ImageNet is the tool that enabled the CNNs right. to be trained for image recognition. Without that, it couldn't have happened. So now there's a big shift because it's hard. You know, when the uh, cost to train chat GPT is probably around $50 million. That's a big number by university scale. So I think we're going to face some challenges for universities and for the kind of innovation and the revolutionary work that universities do. It's gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna face some challenges yeah. uh, staying competitive in that, in that with the big yeah. companies. By the way, that a training cost is going to down dramatically. Training cost will come down. Training cost will come down, these big models. But you know, remember that uh, the underlying uh, uh, GPT 3.5 is about 100 and, uh, 175 billion parameters, billion parameters that have to be set. It's set trained with about 45 terabytes of data. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's a giant web crawl. Think of, think of 10, think of this thing being trained with 10 times Wikipedia. And that's roughly what the training set for these things is. So it's a big problem. It'll get better. It'll get better, especially if you build, a, if you build an engine that's tailored at one thing. And these base large level, mo these large models, large language models, become a base and you use them. You don't retrain the entire model every time. So, so there's a lot of improvement that will be had. Great. I, I'm going to do something like incredibly radical, something I don't think that any Stanford professor or conference session has ever done before. I'm actually going to end early. We still have four minutes left. And the reason I want to end early is to make a point. We've been talking a lot about productivity. It's been a fantastic session. And I, I think ba based on a metric of fantasticness per minute, we now have you know, pushed, pushed the bar up a bit. So. All right. <laughs>